simple harmonic oscillators are any variable that change in time according to a sine or a cosine function. The time it takes the oscillator to go through a complete cycle is called the period and it's measured in seconds. The amplitude of a simple harmonic oscillator is the maximum displacement from equilibrium. The time it takes for a mass to complete one oscillation is 2 pi root m over k. Notice that the period does not depend on the amplitude. Increasing the amplitude will make the speed larger at equilibrium, but it will not reduce the time required for a complete cycle. The endpoints are where the displacement is largest. It's also where the force, acceleration, and spring potential energy are largest. The total energy in a mass spring system is 1 half k times the amplitude squared. If you instead hang the mass spring system from the ceiling and let it oscillate, the period will still be 2 pi root m over k. It does not depend on the gravitational acceleration. For a pendulum, the period depends only on the length of the pendulum and the gravitational acceleration. It also does not depend on the amplitude, but you have to assume that the amplitude is small. Notice also that the period of a pendulum does not depend on the mass that's hung from the end of the pendulum. Waves occur when you disturb a medium, causing ripples to spread outward. The speed of any wave can be solved for by multiplying the wavelength by the frequency. The speed of the wave refers to how fast the wave peaks are moving to the right. The wavelength is the distance between peaks. This is different from the period. The period is the time it takes, in seconds, for one peak to travel one wavelength. The frequency is the number of times a point on a wave will oscillate up and down in one second. Remember that the frequency is just one over the period, and the period is just one over the frequency. There are two types of waves. The first wave is the transverse wave. In this wave, the velocity of the wave, in other words, the direction in which the crests seem to be moving, is perpendicular to the direction in which the medium is actually oscillating. The other type of wave is a longitudinal wave. In a longitudinal wave, the direction of the velocity is parallel to the direction in which the medium is oscillating. The most common transverse waves are light, water waves, and waves on a string. The most common longitudinal wave is sound. Transverse waves are polarizable, but longitudinal waves are not polarizable. Remember that the only way to change the velocity of a wave is to change the properties of the medium it's traveling in. In other words, to change the speed of sound, you have to change something about the air itself. A sound wave with larger amplitude will just sound louder, and a sound wave with higher frequency will just sound higher. But they'll still travel with the same speed. To change something about the material itself, you could increase the temperature of the air, which would make the sound wave travel faster. If two waves overlap, you get wave interference. If the peaks of the two waves line up, you get constructive interference. And if the peaks of one wave line up with the valleys of the other wave, you get destructive interference. If you start with a speaker sending out a certain wavelength, and you put an identical speaker next to it, the two waves will be traveling the same distance to any observer that's located to the right. Since the length of the paths that these two waves travel through are the same, the path length difference is going to be zero. The peaks of these two waves line up perfectly, so a path length difference of zero gives you constructive interference. If you move one of the speakers forwards a distance of one wavelength, the path length difference will be one wavelength. These two waves also line up perfectly, so a path length difference of one wavelength also gives constructive interference. If you make the path length difference two wavelengths, you'll also get constructive interference. In fact, path length differences, which equal a whole number of wavelengths, will always be constructive. If instead you create a path length difference equal to a half wavelength, the peaks of one wave will line up with the valleys of the other wave and you'll get destructive interference. In fact, path length differences equal to a half integer wavelength are always going to be destructive. If we flip the sound wave coming out of one speaker upside down, we call it a phase shift of pi. In this case, a path length difference of zero creates destructive interference since the peaks line up with the valleys. A path length difference of one wavelength will also be destructive. In fact, if one of the speakers is phase shifted by pi, path length differences of a whole number of wavelengths are all going to be destructive. Similarly, if you take your pi shifted speaker and create path length differences equal to half integer wavelengths, they're all going to be constructive. So recapping, path length differences equal to a whole number of wavelengths are going to be constructive. Path length differences equal to half integer wavelengths are going to be destructive unless one of the waves is phase shifted by pi, in which case you have to reverse the conditions and it's the half integer wavelengths which give you constructive and the whole integer wavelengths which give you destructive. You might be wondering what happens if we phase shift both speakers by pi. 
In this case, the two waves line up perfectly again as if nothing happened. In fact, phase shifting both waves is the same as not shifting any waves at all. To create a Pi phase shift in a speaker, just reverse the wires on the back of the speaker. If you want to create a Pi phase shift in light, just reflect it off of a slow material. In other words, a material through which it would travel more slowly than the material it was in originally. Light that's traveling in a slow material that reflects off of a fast material does not experience a Pi phase shift. This is similar to wave pulses traveling on a string. If the end of the string is tied to the pole, the wave is reflected with a Pi phase shift upside down. And if the end of the string is connected to the pole but it's allowed to move up and down, the wave will get reflected without a Pi phase shift. In problems involving thin film interference, light strikes the top of the thin film. Some of that light is reflected off the top of the thin film and continues on in the medium it was in originally. Some of the light continues on through the thin film material and reflects off the interface at the bottom of the thin film. When the light wave that bounced off the bottom of the thin film overlaps the light wave that bounced off the top of the thin film, they'll interfere with each other. If the peaks of the two waves line up, you'll get constructive interference, and if the peak of one wave lines up with the valley of the other wave, you'll get destructive interference. We know how to figure out whether it's going to be constructive or destructive interference because we know that path length differences equal to whole number of wavelengths are constructive, and path length differences equal to half number of wavelengths are destructive. Since the thickness of the thin film is T, and the wave that traveled through the thin film had to travel an extra distance of 2 times t, the path length difference for thin film interference is always going to be 2 times the thickness of the thin film. So our requirement that the path length difference equal whole number of wavelengths just turns into 2 times t equals a whole number of wavelengths. Similarly, if we wanted to find the thicknesses that would give us destructive interference, we could just set 2 times t equal to half integer wavelengths. This is the procedure you could use for any thin film problem. Simply write down 2 times t equals whole number of wavelengths for constructive, and 2 times t equals half integer wavelengths for destructive. The only thing left to do is to determine whether the waves that got reflected received a pi phase shift or not. If neither wave receives a pi phase shift upon reflection, or if both waves receive a pi phase shift upon reflection, you leave the conditions for constructive and destructive interference as they are. However, if one wave receives a pi phase shift upon reflection, and the other wave does not receive a pi phase shift upon reflection, you have to reverse the conditions for constructive and destructive interference. In this example, if we assume that the thin film is a small piece of plastic and each side is surrounded by air, the light wave that's reflecting off the top of the thin film will be reflecting off of a slow material since light travels slower through plastic than it does in air. Because it reflects off of a slow material, it will receive a pi phase shift. The light wave that reflects off the bottom of the thin film will be reflecting off of a faster material since light travels faster through air than it does in plastic. Because of this, it will not receive a pi phase shift upon reflection. Overall, this means that there is a relative phase shift between the two waves. In other words, one wave gets a pi phase shift and the other wave does not. Because of this, we do have to reverse the conditions for constructive and destructive interference. In other words, 2 times t equals half integer wavelengths is going to give us constructive interference, and 2 times t equals whole number of wavelengths is going to give us a destructive interference. Be careful because the wavelength in these equations for thin film interference always refers to the wavelength that the light has while it's in the thin film. If you're given the wavelength that the light has while it's in the air, just divide by n, the index of refraction of the thin film.